Early in 1945, RAF Bomber Command and the 8th Air Force flew an incredible series of operations that dropped food and not bombs on occupied Holland. Join us today on the Damcasters as we meet someone who was likely saved by Operation Chowhow. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Damcasters. And we've got a great episode for you this week because we're going to be chatting with Lucy Hansen, who was 11 years old when the Germans invaded the Netherlands in 1940 and was 14 when the bombers arrived, not to drop bombs, but to save her and her family by bringing much needed supplies to break the hunger winter. It's quite a story. So we're going to be learning about what it was like living under occupation and what it was like to not fear the bombers for the first time. Lucy's wonderful, and I have to thank the team at the 390th Memorial Museum within the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, for inviting Lucy to join us here on the Damcasters. So many thanks to Bill and Alex and the team there. And of course, thank you to the team at the Pima Air and Space Museum for continuing to sponsor the Damcasters. They help keep the lights on. And through them, we've been able to meet the amazing teams at the 390th and elsewhere that keep these episodes coming. So we're not going to hang around because this really is a fantastic chat. You're also going to see why I don't use Zoom <laughs> to make these videos and podcasts because the it all goes a bit squirrely. And I've tried to clean up the audio as best I can. It's not all in sync, so I apologize for that. But Lucy's tale can overcome technical glitches as she tells us all about her early life in the Netherlands during the Second World War. Over to Lucy. What brings you to the 3090th Museum? What, why, why are you in Tucson? Well, I, I have a friend I made quite a few years ago. We were talking about the war. And um, when she heard that I was in, in Europe, in, in the Netherlands, during World War II, she said, oh, you have to come to that museum we have. I walk into the museum and I see the B-17. And I said, <laughs> oh, that saved my life. Oh, that seems wonderful. So I, I guess let, let's go back to your childhood. How how old were you when the when the war came to Holland in 1940? In 1940, I was 11 years old. And what what do you remember from that time? Was you know was your family expect expecting things to get worse, or were you hoping it was going to be okay? As when you're 11 years old, you know you are just con you are con concerned about school. Right, <laughs> and I heard people talking about the Germans coming in, and but that went over my head. So, I, I guess that sort of experience, because you know, sort of being eleven and into a teenager during the war years, it was, it was quite quite an experience for you, was it? What what were sort of those those early years like under German occupation for you as someone who's just trying to go to school and be a normal kid? Oh, no, we were not normal because we were lived in fear, mm. always in fear, because the Germans told us you cannot do this, you cannot do that. And the worst was that because the Germans themselves in Germany, all the men were in the, in the, in the war, mm -hmm. Air Force, whatever. And... Uh, there was nobody in the factories to make the planes. Let's put it that way. So what did they do? They will go to their occupied countries and they ask our men to go. Well, our men didn't go. So when they didn't go, they were forced to come to Germany and work in the planes in the, in the factories. Mm -hmm. That makes a big impression on a kid. I, I can I can imagine. So wh where was home for you in the Netherlands? Hilversum, the Netherlands. Hilversum, mm -hmm. south of Amsterdam, where all the radio stations are. Okay, I know Amsterdam. I'm afraid I don't know your hometown. 
<laughs> I will. Yeah, we we are thinking about going. I, I I have I have friends in the city, so we'll have to pop over. Look, looking at that sort of time, what what was happening with your family? Was it your was it your father? Did you have any older brothers that were being taken away by the Germans? No, I had only little sisters. Okay was my dad, but he was lucky. He was born in 1901. So by that time, he was already 43 years old. And they thought he was a little too old to mm -hmm. come to, to Germany to work in the factories. So he was in a camp for a week. And uh, all his friends were sent to Germany to work there. But my dad came home. Thank goodness. But he oh, still has to be very careful because they were very short of work, work people in Germany. Those sort of early years of the war with, with the Germans asserting themselves over you, what, what was happening in your in your town? Did you did you see much of the war as it was happening? Were there, you know, see aircraft overhead? What what were those sort of first few years like for you as a child watching well, watching everything change? Thank goodness there was not much war. Mm -hmm. fighting in my area and all. This was a war where the, milk, the, the war was fought in the air. Mm -hmm. That's what I remember the most, that at night, you know, many, many planes started in England, had to flow away Holland to come to Germany and drop their bombs. See? So that... Mm -hmm. What I remember the most is the fear, the fear of going to bed at night and hearing all these planes coming over and the Germans shooting at them and you praying that they, one of those planes didn't come down on your head. Because I guess the, the noise from that would have got louder and louder as the more planes were going over. Yes. The planes mm -hmm. were much louder than they are now. Yeah. Oh, very, very much so. Yeah. So, what was it like as a child? I, I've, I've, I've always been fascinated by you know, the, the, the younger experience of the war for for things like birthdays and and celebrations under occupation. Did did your did your parents still make sort of big events of those those milestones in your life, or or was it difficult as well? Because you know, this the, the war is the war, but let's talk about the Parsis. What, what did you get up to? I know what you are thinking. You are thinking about birthday cakes and things. Oh, like yes. <laughs> we didn't have a birthday cake in years. <laughs> we didn't have enough food to just keep us alive. No, festivals, there were not very many festivals, but we were not dead yet. I mean, we mm -hmm. made the best of it. And, and besides that, if you have no electricity, you know, there is not much going on at night with parties because besides it is cold in the winter, it was very cold. We had no gas and no electricity. So a house is not very cozy to have parties, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. I often sort of wonder about these sort of the, the normal things that you would expect from, from, from life going through. But I, I guess... With the Germans there taking as as whatever they needed as well, life was just getting worse and worse as as the years got towards the landings in Normandy and slowly working their way towards Holland. We were just waiting for them to come, but it took them a long time. And in the meantime, you know, I am eleven when the war starts, and I'm what fourteen years old now. At towards the end of the war, I had no shoes because I had outgrown my shoes. And I had outgrown my clothes. So I always got old, older dresses from cousins and aunts. And life was not very pleasant. Let's put it that way. And besides that, talking about birthday cakes, <laughs> we had hardly enough food to eat. You know, like meat. We, no, we never had meat. If we had meat, we had a rabbit. Grandma and Grandpa had rabbits, and thank goodness he could enough food for those rabbits. So on Christmas, the big thing was that Grandpa would come with a rabbit, and we would have a rabbit for dinner. I am partial to a bit of rabbit, I have to say. <laughs> I, 
So let's let's start talking about that that sort of nineteen forty four time when things really start to happen. You have so many aircraft overheads. You have the armies working their way through France. I'm assuming things got worse because the Germans were getting a little bit worried about what was going to happen. So in your in your town, as you know, the, the the fighting was in France and then Belgium. What was happening? Were they preparing for a battle in Holland around you, or were the Germans just carrying on as they had done for the last few years? Oh, they were very calm and quiet. They they didn't seem to be excited that there would be a battle coming. Mm. Because there was nothing going on. See, what do you do in a country where there is no electricity, there is no gas? So in normal days, you go to the movies or, well, you know, we had no electricity, no gas, one hour of water in the morning. All you, what the, what the, what the people in the country are concerned about is how do we survive? You did just mention movies, though. What, huh? what mo- you mentioned movies. What movies did you get to watch? There were no movies. <laughs> there were no movies. Okay, I, I I misheard you. That that was on that was on me. Mention, you know, people get bored, and what you do bored now is you watch movies or you watch TV. We had nothing like that in mm. 1944. Life was dull. One of my listeners, my my friend Joe, who came with me to the museum when we were there in Tucson and had a look at their lovely B seventeen. He he was he wanted to ask you. Did did you sort of ever feel that you were abandoned by everybody else, or were you just waiting for the Americans and the British, and as my case, the Canadians to arrive? Was it just a case of waiting, or were you? Yeah, that's what we were doing. We were just waiting to come because my my mother was always very optimistic and very uh, well. You know, she told us kids. This is not going to last forever. There will be an end to this. Someday we will be free again. So let's talk about those years then. 1944, the Allies burst into Holland and go race, racing off sort of around around you, I suppose, as they head to Arnhem. I guess things got pretty exciting there for a little while. Did Was everybody thinking that the war was going to end and you were to be liberated quite quickly in, in 1944? Well, we had to go through that. We had to eat first, you know. We were yeah. with family. And we hoped that we, we would live till the end of the war. It's very difficult for people to understand that you go into a grocery store and there's nothing there. Or you go to a shoe store and there are no shoes. And a little girl wants a new dress. There is nothing in the store. All the stores were closed. There was no lights. We were just waiting to be liberated. We think of things being hard, but we've we have very little comprehension to what real hardship is. That's, that's why I talk today. Mm. The reality of World War II is very difficult for Americans to understand. You see, I could make a joke about that, but I'm not going to make any jokes about the Americans today because we're we're, we're being nice to them. Yes. Ho- hello, Bill and Alex, if you're listening. Let's get straight to it then. So the famine is starting sort of the what we remember as the the great the great famine in, at, during the winter of 1944 and 45. The from what I remember reading, is that sort of also when the Germans just stole everything? Is yeah. is that right? What whatever was left, they just took. Do yeah. you have any memories of that? Oh gosh, yes. I just told the story to the group that I was talking to. Mm-hmm. That, like I said, we had no gas or electricity. Well, how do you cook? You need heat to cook food. So first of all, we had cut down all the trees along the roads. You know how Holland is. We had yep. lots of beautiful trees. Well, all the trees were gone. So what did we do then? Underneath the railroad, there were no trains running anymore because the Germans had taken all our trains. Uh, You have the railroad tracks. And what is underneath the railroad tracks? Railroad ties. Mm -hmm. Those big pieces of wood? Yep. 
Well, that's what we burned in our little pot belly stoves to cook a little food. And it is hard work to get one of those railroad ties mm -hmm. because I was, what, 14 years old? I had a bicycle. Uh, no tires, of course. They were long to our wore out. So my friends and I, we go on our bicycle. We bicycle to the railroad tracks and we get the railroad tries. Have you ever looked down on one of those huge, big railroad ties? Mm -hmm. Well, we hoisted one of them on my bicycle on the seat and the steering wheel. And they, I don't know how much they weigh. And that's how I walked home. And then we had wood so mom could boil some water <laughs> and cook some potatoes. People, people don't understand how difficult it was, but we survived. Hmm. I so was was potatoes the the main thing you got to eat? Did you? I I'm I'm I, I I totally understand there wasn't a loss of choice, but was it sort of potatoes and whatever vegetables you you could grow that that sort of thing? Thank goodness, we my dad had a little plot of land, and we always grew our own potatoes. And if there was room, we had little green beans and little vegetables. That's all. That's what no meat. No bread. We didn't have an oven to bake a bread. We didn't have flour. We didn't have nothing. Potatoes was our main food. What do you think of potatoes now? I still eat potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> so eating them all the time, you didn't get too put off by them. No, no, they say I like. We're going to take a quick break to pop to the Pima Air and Space Museum to visit with Director of Collections Andrew Bailey and find out about one of the aircraft in the incredible Pima collection. Hi, I'm Andrew Bailey, Director of Collections here at the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm here today to talk about our newest acquisition, a unique aircraft that we're really excited about adding to the collection. And you can see it right here behind us. And that's the Boeing 747SP Sophia. It's unique in two different ways. First, a Boeing 747 SP. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of what a Boeing 747 is, but many of you may not know what an SP is. During the 70s, Boeing came up with an idea of that they needed a different aircraft, a smaller aircraft that was a wide body that could compete with other smaller wide bodies like the DC-10 and the L-1011. They also wanted an aircraft that could fly long distances without having to refuel. So they came up with the 747 SP which is essentially a 747 with a shorter fuselage, about 47 feet shorter than the 747-100, a taller tail and other different changes. They allowed the aircraft to fly at higher altitudes and longer distance. The first one was delivered to Pan Am in 1976. It flew Pan Am's longest route, which was from New York City to Tehran in Iran, uh, nonstop. A year later, this aircraft went into service with Pan Am and was named Clipper Lindbergh, named after the famed aviator. The aircraft also spent time flying with United before retiring from airline service. Only 45 SPs were ever built, partially because they were just too expensive to maintain and to fly, and also newer airliners were coming out that could fly farther distances with a cheaper cost. So what does SOFIA stand for? SOFIA stands for Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. That means this aircraft has a 19-ton telescope mounted inside it. SOFIA was a combined project with NASA and the German Space Agency. Many space objects emit their energy in the infrared wavelength, which means they can't be seen through a traditional telescope, which is why this aircraft has an infrared telescope. SOFIA flew her missions at 45,000 feet, flying 99% above the infrared blocking atmosphere. This allowed the telescope to see things that ground-based telescopes couldn't see. Sophia was also mobile. This allowed her to fly literally almost anywhere in the world to take observations. Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, even out over the ocean where there are no ground-based telescopes. Despite all this, last year NASA and the German Space Agency decided to retire Sophia. 
We are lucky to have Sophia retire here to the Pima Air and Space Museum, where she will be displayed along with other NASA aircraft like the Super Guppy, the Vomit Comet, and the NB-52A X-15 mothership. To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum and to see the incredible collection that they have, please visit www.pimaair.org for more information and be sure to give them a follow via all the links in the description to this episode. And now, back to the show. Let's sort of get to that time then when when the food started falling from the sky. There's a, there's a few questions that, that the listeners have asked really as well. That Did did you have any evacuations of, of people from the big cities to, to your town? Did you have children coming down? Yes. Was there, was there many people coming out of the cities to try to, to find food and, and things? No, you, you, they didn't come to my little town. My little town, like my mother, would go to the farmers because they mm -hmm. all had a few cows and we would get a little uh, milk, for instance, and they had to grow some grain, some wheat or whatever. And my mom, my mother would go to the farmhouses and ask, beg for that kind of food. I, I suppose when she was able to get fresh milk and things like that, that would be a great treat, would it be in the house? My goodness. She, uh, she I don't know. She bought, she got one. I, what I remember the most is one time she came back with a bag of wheat. Well, you know, what do you do with a bag of wheat? You have to make flour out of it, right? Well, we have an old coffee grinder, you know, that you sit there and grind the coffee. Well, mom said, let's try this and see if this will become flour. And it did. I sat there for hours grinding wheat. So she would have a little, little kind of coarse flour and then mix it with water, make tiny little pancakes. And on top of that little pot belly stove that we had in the living room, she would make little pancakes. No syrup, no brown sugar, no jam, no butter, nothing. Just wheat and water. But it it's wasn't potatoes. For people to understand, mm. but that is the truth. <laughs> yeah. When did you first hear that there was going to be food dropped on your village by the Americans in the RAF? Well, we of course we were a little hesitant. Because mm -hmm. we are under German occupation, and you know the Germans are not very nice. I've but heard that. Yes, <laughs> this time they, they, I guess they cooperated, and uh, we just waited. And then one day we heard that there will be a food dropping today, and I lived on the edge of my town, and behind there's the heather fields to the next town. And they had made a big white cross, so the planes knew where to drop, you know, otherwise mm -hmm. they dropped them too fast or maybe too late. And then it was maybe in between houses where you could hardly get to the food. Eighth Air Force heavies dropped food in Nazi-occupied Holland at Utrecht, Rotterdam, and Amsterdam during April and the first part of May. At the Great Ashfield base in the Midlands, B-17s were loaded with U.S. Army rations to be dropped to starving Dutch civilians. Some missions had to be scrubbed when German commanders were reluctant to negotiate a short armistice, guaranteeing planes safe passage on the mercy runs. RAF heavy bombers also engaged in these food-dropping sorties. Skimming the water, the formations passed over beach obstructions on the Dutch coast, flooded areas, ruined villages, and the hungry, waving populace. The Germans had agreed to complete immunity for Allied planes in 10 dropping zones from 700 hours to 1,500 hours daily. However, some bomber crews noted rifle and light anti-aircraft fire. The first dropping was at Utrecht.
Another mission was to an airfield about five miles southwest of Amsterdam. The Luftwaffe had recently operated from this base. Now, instead of a swastika, a cross marked the zone that meant protection for Allied planes. By May 1st, enough food had been dropped to feed four million persons for one day. In contrast to the days when Nazi planes brought destruction to Rotterdam, Allied planes were now bringing Dutch cities sustenance. So no, I and I saw certain calls where they were very low, very scary because we were afraid of airplanes. They had bombs on them, so. Oh no, we, uh, but it was cordon to half. It was all, we could not, everybody could just go to the head of the fields and see what you could catch <laughs> like that. <laughs> it was all coordinated nicely and it was all in big bags and, and boxes and it was not too far, it was far away from where the people were standing. Mm -hmm. And when they were done, then some little organizations from the town would come. They had no no big trucks because we had no trucks, no no uh, cars, no nothing. Somehow they got it all downtown and put it all together, you know, like the, the flour, flour with flour and rice and rice and things like that. And then we got food coupons, and then everybody could come with your coupons, and you got so much as they had collected. There was good planning around it, so it wasn't just everybody rushing to try to grab. But you, it was all—it was all well done. Oh, it was well organized. Oh yeah, yeah. You don't want to get a big, a big bag of rice on your head. That's too dangerous. So when that first food arrived. What was your first meal with your rations that you got? Do you remember? No. <laughs> That's almost eighty years ago. I I was just wondering if, if they yeah you know, they they'd snuck any sort of special treats into the packages just besides rice and 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 flour and maybe and... the rice. Yeah. Yeah. Because you need only water to to cook rice. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was just the rice, yeah. But we had no, not no brown sugar or, or any sweetness to put on there. We didn't even know what it was. So had had you ever had rice before, or was that a, a new thing? Oh no, we we all we ate rice. Mm, yeah, you you mentioned before that the airplanes were scary because they they'd had bombs and and things on them normally. These airdrops happened for quite a while, didn't they? Did, did how many do you, they come very often to your town, or was it just that one time? No, only twice. That's only it. twice. Okay. Yeah, because the Ger the Germans wanted to shoot at those planes, of course, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they had only, I think, a contract with with the Allies that they could do it only on certain two days, and that was it. But then a week later, we had the door was open. See, the droppings were the end of April, and we were liberated on May 5th. So that's only a week. Which units came to your town, do you remember? Was Which which army arrived? The, uh, the, the first army that, that I was English. Mm -hmm. I happened to talk. I had, I was waiting for the food droppings on the big on the big road. And there was nobody there. And all of a sudden, a green tank comes down the road. And it was green because German was gray. You know, everything mm -hmm. was gray. So I kind of went in the bushes, but he had seen me already. And he stopped and he came out of the top. I didn't know you came out of the top from a tank. He comes up to me and he said, where are the waterworks? Well, thank goodness I had three years of English in school. So I knew what he was then. So I mentioned where it was. It was right in the Van Helmerfields there. And in my very best English, I said, Where are you from? He said, Liverpool, England. 
I'm I'm surprised you were able to understand him if he was from Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my, my football team got beat by Liverpool on Sunday, so I'm, I'm still a bit upset about that. <laughs> your, your mind goes a different way when you hear about Liverpool. Huh? Yes, it, it does. Yeah, we, we didn't we didn't play well. So that, oh, no, that's that's some, that's something else to discuss for later. I guess joy was the feeling of, of seeing seeing the English arrive and things started to change. That must be an understatement, I suppose. Well, we were so happy. And, you know, this this special man from Liverpool made me so happy because while we are looking at each other and trying to talk, me with my three-year English, uh, picks, takes out his pack of cigarettes and lights a cigarette. And I say, you have a cigarette? Of course, he said, you want one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like one for my father. So I, he gave me one, and I ran home to give that cigarette to my father, who hadn't smoked a cigarette in three or four years. <laughs> <laughs> how how quickly did things change once once the Germans were were gone? Did it did it take? Yeah, was it was it quite quick that you started getting more more food in and things, or was it a slow process to start seeing changes? Very slow progress. Yeah, because I, I guess with yeah, you know, I, I remember speaking to my my friend's grandmother who was who was also Dutch, and she said there was there was nothing there, so it took a long time to get new things, and I guess that was yes. the same for you. Yes, but we had hope. You know, he knew that things would get better. The thing that I always remember growing up in Canada, and I lived in Ottawa for a while, was was the tulips that the Dutch would send to us every spring to for you know li liberating the the, the coast and, and things. And Ottawa would always be covered in tulips. And we, you know, visit, visiting Holland, especially checking checking out um, some of the sites there, always been made very very welcome. The liberation of Holland for you, I guess, was the start of the rest of your life, really. And I was just wondering, what what did what did you do next? Did, were you able to 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 get back to school? And you clearly your English is superb, so therefore your three years of English have continued quite well. No, uh, I always <laughs> I always had in mind that after the war, I'm I'm going to America. You know that that was <laughs> something. So um, I graduated in 45, so school was over with. There was nothing to do. So um, I don't remember exactly what I did, but quite of us and my friends, we went to England as an old pair and stayed with the family for one year to mm -hmm. teach our English. So if we came to the United States, we were not a bunch of dummies. We could speak. <laughs> where did where did you come to in England? I went to Birmingham. Oh dear, they they, they have as strange an accent as the Liverpudlians. So <laughs> yeah, but I was in the family. They were not typical English. She had she and her parents, the lady of the house and her uh -huh. and she was oh about twenty years old. Came from Germany. They escaped. Germany because they were Jewish. Oh wow! Yeah, so you had that yeah, connection to Jewish family. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they came so, from Germany, so they learned their English, so they did not have that Birmingham accent. <laughs> I, I I shouldn't I shouldn't make jokes about the Birmingham accent. They're, they're very they're very protective of their accent. Well, you get an answer. <laughs> oh yes, I I, I do. There, there'll be angry comments, but I, I can live with I can live with those. So when when did you get to the the, the United States for the first time? If that was the dream, when My, when was the first time you went? Nineteen sixty three. Nineteen sixty three. Right. It's sixty one years ago. I, I I should have asked you this before. Really, how, how long did you stay? Did you go back and forth? Because uh, cl clearly, you you still sound very Dutch. So I'm, I'm assuming you you have returned home. Oh yeah, of course I've I've returned home. 
when I could afford it. <laughs> <laughs> when you go as a poor immigrant, you know, you are not rich. No. But I was lucky. I, uh, My sister and brother-in-law had been in in California in, 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 already for four years. So I stayed with them for, oh, less than a year. And then I went on my own. When you talk to people, you've been chatting to lots of people at the museum today. Mm -hmm. How have they reacted to what you've told them about your life? What, is, what has been their reaction to you so far? Well, they, they, I think they were very happy to hear my stories <laughs> because they didn't have times like that in America. They had, they, they had a war, but it was outside their own country. And that's what, what I wanted to tell the people now, that war is not only shooting and killing each other, but it is about the people who live in the country, what they have to go through. They lose their freedom. Uh, they have to obey different rules. Life is completely different than what they are used to. So, and, and, and I like to emphasize that you can survive. You have to be strong. Very strong. And clearly you and, and your family were. So what, this is going to be a bit of a roundabout question. You've You've seen seen the aeroplane they have there today, the the B seventeen. Looking back now, does that aeroplane still give you a bit of fear, or do you just remember the food that it brought? Oh no, I'm happy to see that aeroplane. <laughs> it made me survive. It brought mm -hmm. me food. But when I see that now, when I walk in the museum, I didn't realize it was that big. Mm. makes me feel I cannot explain how I feel when I see that plane I say oh D-17 <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's crazy maybe crazy but it is it is a, it is a very lovely airplane Alex and, and Bill they let me go inside which was very kind of it it was very mm -hmm. nice of them Lucy, this has been absolutely lovely to meet you. So thank you so much for 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 sharing sharing your story. Is there anything else you want to tell us before you you can go and relax after talking to everybody for the the whole morning? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I've been talking <laughs> all morning. I'm I'm getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> In in which case, I just want to say again, thank you so much. This has been an absolute delight. And I, I do hope they're taking good care of you there. If, if they're not, let me know and I'll have a little word with them. <laughs> no, we just had a very nice lunch. And now we, uh, I don't live here. I live in Prescott. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow I'm going home. My so good friend. My good friend Gail is driving me home tomorrow, and then I will relax. <laughs> a well-deserved relax, and many thanks, and have a very safe journey home tomorrow. Thank you very much. Nice meeting you. Lovely to meet you. I cannot thank Lucy Hansen enough for joining us here on the Damcasters, and once again to thank Alex and Bill and the whole team at the 390th Memorial Museum in Tucson, Arizona, for asking Lucy to join us and spend a bit of time at the end of her very busy day at the museum to talk to us. I think that period of time in Holland is cruelly, cruelly under discussed. And the hunger winter is is terrible. You know, Audrey Hepburn lived through it. One of the reasons why she was able to stay as thin as she was because she suffered severe malnutrition as a teenager. In the links to the description below, I'm going to put the link to the Dutch National Archives, their photo collection on the hunger winter. I didn't use all those photos because they're quite harrowing, but I think you should check them out just to see how bad things got and the necessity for Operations Mana and Chow Hound to be flown because it was a famine. And as Lucy pointed out, it was rough. People were sifting for coal dust to be able to heat their own homes. And 
it's amazing that both sides in that incredibly cruel war were able to stop for certain windows to allow food to be flown in for the Dutch. So thank you, Lucy. Go check out everything you can about Holland during the Second World War. Fascinating, fascinating things. Lots of complexities in there as well. If you'd like to support the pod, become a damn guest here for just three pounds a month plus a bit of that. You get these episodes early. I record a special intro for everybody as well, ad free on the Patreon too. So there's no interruptions for the stories we get to bring you. It's great fun. We've got our Zoom social coming up at the end of the month where we can all get together, shoot the breeze. Still think we're going to talk about airplane movies for that one. So be sure to join us for that. Links in the description below. Do check out Pima and the 390th. All of that will be in there as well. But thank you so much for joining us. Lucy, once again, if you're watching, thank you for giving us your time. It was an incredible tale that you told us. And thank you so much for that. Until next time, everyone, do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Dam Castiers on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.